Hello and welcome back to Consume Chats. This morning we're going to be chatting with Amy Fung or Amy Picks. Um, so this month we're doing a series speaking to people from the ESA community about their career pathways um, and this morning we're going to speak to Amy about her career as a graphic designer, illustrator and writer and also the work that she does with BC. Um, ESA Heritage Month is happening for the whole of September um, so we'll be talking to various people from the community. Um, it's a month-long celebration of culture, community, food, arts and everything in between um, from the East and South East Asian community in the UK. So we're really pleased that we can be having these little chats with people to see about their background and um, hopefully showcase some role models um, that you may not know about or that you already really want to hear about from the community. So I'm just going to see if Amy is available now. Away. Jasmine, she is. Morning. Hi, how are you? Good, thank you. Second time in a week that we're seeing each other. I know, I know. I hope that's okay. I hope it's not too much. <laughs> always a pleasure, Amy. Always a pleasure. All right, I'm just going to turn my volume up so I can hear you. There we go. Hello, David. Hello, Sam. Hello. <laughs> so we're in a different location today. We're in Consume Comms headquarters in Leeds and Amy is back down in London this week. So Amy, um, Amy and I met through back at the Lunar New Year. And yes. Maybe a little bit before at um, online, uh, as everyone meets now, as being Instagram pals. Um, and We've have done a few things together. Um, we've previously done a collab for Yellow Rice Co, where Amy illustrated um, some of some bespoke labels for um, a collab with Little Yellow Rice Co and Mama Bear. Um, so, Amy, you tell us a little bit about yourself, what you do, and your background. Yes, I actually remember the moment that I came across you and Little Yellow Rice Co. It's because I was putting together a Lunar New Year gift guide, and I was like, "Oh, I'll whack them on." And uh, yeah, and so we obviously tagged you and saw you. And so, yeah, that was the start of a beautiful story. Um, so, yeah, I'm a graphic designer. Uh, I illustrate sometimes too. Sometimes I write. Um, I know that professionally I'm known as a graphic designer. That's what I put on my LinkedIn. But, you know, just like everyone else, we do multiple things. And, um, you know, I do what I'm passionate about. And, yeah, I guess the main thing that makes me money is graphic design. So that's my day job. Uh, but also, I am a co-founder of BSEEN, which is Britain's East and Southeast Asian network. And yeah, I do that. Um, I, I was going to say on the side, which seems to minimise it, but actually it is a massive part of my life. And as you've mentioned, we've launched EC Heritage Month, which is our big campaign at the moment. So that's been going for about a year. Okay. And um, so today's chat is a little bit to understand um, your career pathway. So... Yeah, but coming from a creative background, we're based in the creative coding space. I think um, when you call yourself a graphic designer, it's, it's never just one thing. You spun so much stuff and it's never a straight path. I mean, we have got a few graphic designers here who started off with that intention, did the degree and are doing the job, which is fantastic. But I think most people's pathways are a little bit of a squiggle. So um, would you be happy to tell us a little bit about where, what you started doing um, in your kind of academics and then kind of how you ended up where you are now? So yeah, a little bit of a squiggle for me is such an understatement. <laughs> um, I studied English literature at uni, so I, I just thought, I love books, I don't know what I want to do. I had absolutely no idea what I wanted to be as an adult. I didn't want to do any adulting, so I was like, I love reading, so I'm just going to do English Lit. Um, after I finished that degree, I literally couldn't look at a book for another five years, like it was way too intense. <laughs> so I ended up doing royalty accounting. Uh, which, yeah, I know, I know, um, which is basically, uh, I work for a company called PPL, so any music that is played in a public place, you need a license, I'm sure many people know this. Uh, so I worked for that company because I just wanted to make some money, get my foot in the door, just get some admin experience, you know, with any job, they're like, you need experience, I was like, okay, I'll do anything. Um, so I did that. I then went traveling, I just thought, okay, I've got itchy feet, I want to go abroad. I lived in Japan for a year, 
Um, I came back and then I basically got back into royalty accounting because that was all that was on my CV. And I did that for seven years. <laughs> I know, I know. Um, and the reason I did that for seven years is because I worked for a company that really looked after you. So although the job itself wasn't something I was particularly passionate about, also, I'm awful at maths. I'm so bad at maths. I can't believe I was in charge of like literally accounts that were worth millions because I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> um it's because I was good at excel so I did that for seven years I loved the people I worked with I made amazing friends but then I thought oh there's you know there's something missing this isn't for me so I did a part-time graphic design course at Shillington yeah. so there's one in Manchester there's one in London in New York I actually wanted to go to the New York one but my payment failed so I had to stay in London <laughs> I told you this was a massive squiggle <laughs> uh so <laughs> I did a graphic design course part-time in the evenings Tuesdays and Wednesday evenings I absolutely loved it it was hectic it was so busy uh, but I really felt so fulfilled and I really enjoyed it I definitely felt like I had found my passion and then when the course ended I had a portfolio so Shillington is a portfolio course you don't get a degree it's not officially recognized you literally just come out with just the portfolio and then I just thought okay I'm just gonna do it I just I just quit my job and then I went freelance straight away and incredibly luckily, I got a job artworking for a massive retail company. They're called Netta Porter. And uh, that's where I sort of cut my teeth um, properly doing. It's not design. Artworking is not the same as design. But I cut my teeth using the skills that I learned on my course um, right at the bottom. I went from, you know, a comfortable salary to literally right back at the bottom again. I moved in with my parents because I was broke. I was living in a studio flat. I couldn't afford it. And then, yeah, I worked my way back up. So now I'm like a lead content designer at um, another company. I'm freelance, but I sort of am contracted by another company. So that, that is my career path. Sorry, it wasn't easy or short to talk about. It was really, that's considering how much you covered. I think um, Consume Sam that you've been chatting to, she also had a similar job with royalty stuff um, straight out of you before she came to marketing with us. Um, Chillington's quite a fast course, isn't it? They do yeah. it, um, We've, we've done some events with Shillington before in, a, in our club capacity. Um, but I quite like that it's a portfolio-based course because at least you come out prepared with something that's ready to go into work. So um, I also love the career change because um, a lot of the events we've done in the past are, you know, it's always about kind of graduates who do need the support. But it's also, you, know, you can change your career at whatever age, you know, as long as you've got the passion. It's never easy. Um, and sometimes you do have to move home but look at look at where you are now you know like your artwork is, is definitely that's where your passion you can tell from the things that you put across um so along the way what other than are there any other kind of milestone challenges that you kind of face um in that career kind of transitioning across or in your other career in your previous life <laughs> absolutely yeah um i just based off what you just said, it is a massive privilege actually to be able to change career as well. If I hadn't have had that buffer of being able to move home, if I didn't have the buffer of being able to save all that money to do a frankly expensive course, to buy frankly expensive equipment, there's no way that I could be doing this what I am doing right now. So I feel very passionate about the fact that it is a career course that would require someone to have a lot of money basically to build it. I'm not saying I'm rich. I am definitely still broke um, in comparison to the majority. Um, but to start off with, to get myself off the ground, it did require a lot. And so, yeah, in general, I'm just very passionate about making sure that people are paid correctly and that people getting in get as much, as, as much help as they can. And that comes from the rest of us speaking up. People like me who have managed to build ourselves up to where we want to be in our career to make sure that we you know, do what we can to help people who are trying to get on that ladder because it's not easy. Um, the challenges I faced were that, yeah, I think one of the main things at the beginning was that people would judge me a lot for just having a portfolio. You know, there's a lot of um, emphasis placed on needing a degree, a graphic design degree. And that's fine. If you've done a degree and it worked for you, that's absolutely OK. Um, but I definitely had situations where I went to interviews, I talked about my work, I was passionate about it, I showed my portfolio, they called me in for the second time and then, you know, 
jobs where I had to literally get the train, spend money to go there, you know. And so again, that's something that costs money. And then they would just say, oh, but you're not, you don't have a degree. You've just got a portfolio. So they didn't even really pay attention to my work. They just wanted someone who had the credentials. And that was really frustrating because I think there's this sort of presumption that you wouldn't be good enough if you'd done this intense kind of course. But I think it's really important to understand that creativity and particularly in graphic design, because I know graphic design, so I can only speak for that, is that it's more than just making something look nice. It's, you know, the person as well, what do they understand? You know, do they enjoy sociology, anthropology, psychology, history, that all plays into everyone's design. And someone who is passionate about that who is interested in more than just something that looks beautiful, but actually has meaning behind it, and that they're able to portray this in their design. That's what's important. So it's so important to find the right designers to meet them and talk to them and know that they understand you. And so I think, yeah, one of the things that I had to get over was being able to show people that I was more than just a designer, you know, I'm someone who understands people. And that's what creates good design. Yeah, I think there's definitely um, there's kind of a few different types of designers. There are designers that are very happy and comfortable, and that's to do piecework um, and work in an agency, and that's fine. But then, if you're going to be an art uh, designer that's freelance, you really have to have that ability to speak to people. Otherwise, you'll end up doing a design, and then they come back. Um, I think um, one person that we always shout about when we're talking about kind of um, graduates is Alec Dodson from Intern. He's done a couple of talks and he always talks like you do about the value of like making sure people are paid properly. Um, and we get a few graduates to come over and they'll do, oh, we'll do free internships. And I don't think it's, it's, I don't think it's a good thing. Even if you can only pay them a little bit, you should always pay or offer something in exchange. Um, it devalues the whole system. Um, and like you say, having got a degree doesn't mean much. I have a degree in design, but I am not a good designer. Um, <laughs> I could, I've just got that on my CV, but I'm not a good designer. That's not where my forte is at all. Whereas someone like you, like you say, having the passion of done a, a short course that honed your skills to be able to do it and go out into the commercial world is, is a lot more value in it. Um, yeah. Did you have any role models, um, you know, kind of at that stage? If you got the enthusiasm, but did you have anyone that you were kind of looking up to or, or kind of uh, not so in the industry, you know, or beyond? Mm, yeah. Um, yeah, back on that payment thing, definitely. I think the first thing that anyone should do is talk about the money first, like ask what is your budget. I always get a bit suspicious when someone comes at me with a brief or approaches me and the first thing they don't talk about is, you know, what are your fees? Uh, if they first of all go, you know, oh, what can you do? Can you, can you, we do a consultation? Can we talk about it? I'm like, well, you have to find out if you can afford the work that I can do because you know, I have confidence in my abilities and it's just a waste of time to enter a conversation until you know that they can afford you. So 100% be really hard ass because at the beginning I was so bad at talking about money. I was really shy about cash. I didn't want to talk about salaries or fees, but now it's just like, I just say it straight away. And especially if they're your mate, if they're your friend, yeah. if they're a family member, still do it, you know, don't let them off. You need to know that you can support yourself. And of course I do favors. If I know it's someone who really needs help or to get off their feet or, you know, of course it really depends on the situation, you should be flexible. But the first thing you should do is understand what your limitations are and make sure that um, you can afford to do that work. Um, even if it's for free, even if you want to do a favor, that's absolutely fine, but make sure that you're not going to get stressed at the end of it. Um, but regards to role models, oh, that's, yeah, I think um, in terms of the design world, I really like, oh gosh, I'm really bad with names, but Jessica yeah. Hish, she's like a really great typographer. Um, there's a really good, um, I really like typography basically, and that's most of the people I look up to. Um, there's an Instagram account called Hom Sweet Hom, and um, it's run by someone who's in the US. Um, they're an EC person, and they do incredible design, and um what i really love about them is that they're all about passion projects and doing something on the side and um you know if you want to be able to do that as your i guess main main job if you want um, and then of course that then changes it because if your passion becomes your job it actually does add a level of stress to it so um, it's not necessary i think i don't want to push the narrative of like everyone should do what they love as their main job because it's actually so much harder it changes the dynamic completely but um i really love that 
they're encouraging people to think out of the box and be passionate about things outside of design, outside of art to look beyond because the whole point of design is that you channel all of those influences into your work because essentially what you're doing is speaking without words. You're speaking with aesthetics, speaking with colors, speaking with shape. And I think the people who I've really looked up to have been people who have shown that they aren't just about the look, about the aesthetic. They care, they care about people, they care about the world. Yeah, I think we have a mutual favourite, don't you? Like Mr Bingo is one of my favourites because I love his attitude that he gave up um, paid work um, because it, was, it, it just wasn't getting him through life. And now he turns down, I think I like that he sticks to his guns, he still turns down commercial work unless it's a big pay, you know, he puts that extra zero on the end if it's not something that is part of his value system. Um, he'll do it, he'll do it for the money and then he'll kind of find some way to pass that money onto a cause or something like that. Um, but I think, yeah, but like what he does, observational stuff. If you're a designer, you've got to be, um, you know, you've got to find things that you enjoy because when you lose that joy, you can't design. It's like writing, same sort of thing. If you don't kind of expose yourself to different things and um, have that, all those different influences, have that melting point, you know, your design doesn't always work out right. Um, so I would agree with that. Typography, we should introduce you to our friend, Ollie, who runs uh, the biggest letter press, I think, in, in the UK, maybe Europe, up here. Wow. Over. It's huge. They're massive. Like, same yeah. point as the kind of letter press things that he does. Um, but is there anybody outside of the industry that you, like, look to as a role model for how to kind of live your life or promote or your uh, professional life? Oh gosh, that's so hard. Um, I'm not really someone who actually really pays attention. Like I know there's some great people yeah, who do really, well. really work. I'm, yeah, I don't know. Um, I'm trying to think of people who are just like, I, I'm, I'm not sure. Probably, I think people I know. It's literally yeah, people I really, I like. <laughs> yeah, I think it's yeah people. It's literally people I know. It's, it's because meeting them personally, you just know that they're human. And that you know they're they're spending their time I suppose speaking out and putting themselves in uncomfortable situations so it's all the different activists that I've met in this space like Mimi who talks about what's happening in Myanmar quite a lot like I really look up to them because she's just so articulate and um, I think shows her human side she's a mother like me and she's very honest about those aspects and yeah I really look up to that because I think I have a complicated feeling about putting people on pedestals. I think that's what I'm trying to say. So I, I think I appreciate people who are just human. And yeah, that's basically everyone I know in the EC community, really. And obviously, Mayan Peterson and uh, <laughs> Charlotte Wong <laughs> and Vivian, Izzy, and Carly. Yeah, they, they're the people I love and I look up to. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Like, I find it uh, hard to kind of uh, role models as a tag, but I think anyone I surround myself with, I, I have a lot of respect for. You, know, you can't as you get older your group gets smaller but it gets to be the people that you respect and want to be around mm -hmm. um, so let's talk a little bit about the bc and stuff so obviously your commercial life and i can very much relate to when you say it's your side project becomes actually just another equal project like your day job um so if you want to go back a step and tell us how that happened how you came to be with that um, working with the team and the various events that happened because that's about a year and a half ago and we covered so much ground um, with the with the organisation since then. Yeah, it's been such a whirlwind. Um, I got a recent update on my IG, you know, memories. Looking yeah. back a year and I posted it on my IG, but it's like this time last year we were just about to launch the website. So we had come together, none of us had ever met before. Uh, we're all living in separate places, quite far away from each other, actually. And um, for me personally, I was following Viv because at around the time that the pandemic started, I getting, started getting a lot of anxiety around, you know, uh, the fact that they were calling it China virus. Um, I knew that there was racialized tones with the way it's being reported. And I remember talking to people around me saying, I'm really scared actually to go out and I'm feeling this sense of fear. And, you know, majority white people were going, no, 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 you're fine. Like, you know, it's okay, there's nothing to worry about. And I know that came from a good place. They wanted me to feel better and to put me at ease, but it didn't at all. And so I started seeking out 
other EC people because I wanted to find someone who could relate. And so I started listening to podcasts and one of them was Viv, so I followed her. And then she posted a petition calling newspapers not to use EC faces in their COVID-19 articles. And I started joining the, I guess, that campaign to try and push it. And then other people started connecting together. So obviously the people I mentioned, Mayan, Carly, Kai and um, Charlie, we all sort of joined forces and then decided to really push this campaign and raise awareness about what was going on because there was a real uptick in hate incidents crimes. We started seeing people posting online, you know, someone being attacked, someone being harassed. And then we thought we wanted to create a space that was safe because that's how we came together. We were able to create a place that was safe for each other to say, I'm scared and someone to say, I understand that. And so we wanted to widen that out to the community to create that space where people could share their joys and struggles. And so that's how BC started. And I think, you know, you've done a fantastic job. Even before East Heritage Month, there's so many things along the way that have kind of brought community together and there are so, I would love to do a, a, a campaign about all the stories of people, how much comfort and you've brought them from the community, because even without the events, you know, we all found a space online to meet, and it's a very broad, diverse space, um, you know, coming from dual kind of background myself, or tribe, because I was born in the UK, there's a lot of things to juggle, and it's a lot of spaces that you feel that you should be occupying to make noise in, but what I love about these scene is that you don't have to feel that pressure, and you know it's sometimes if you've got the energy you can do it but if you don't have the energy then you can just quietly support the rest of the community and I think that's that's the thing that I would like to make sure and also to make sure that we make people aware that the petition for East Heritage Month is still there so um, they can go and sign that but definitely in terms of role models god you six ladies that went and put uh, found each other I think what a force to be reckoned with you kind of out there doing it um i've still get to meet two members of the team i've not met kyle or isabel yet so um but i think yeah that's that's a great cause and in terms of um career progression sometimes you pick up things that aren't uh part of your professional career but i think this is definitely um going to start falling into your professional career do you have any tips for anybody juggling um the kind of side hustle as we can brand it that ne never ends up being a side hustle uh, alongside their work as in their paid job? Yeah, I think the advice I was give it to give is that there's someone who's done it before you. I'm not saying your exact thing. I mean, yeah. who's created a business out there, side hustle. And just to try and help yourself by finding out from them. So you could come to me and say, oh, what's the best website? Where can I order the cheapest uh, packing materials, stuff like that? There's always someone who's done it already and has made the mistake. And if they're a decent person would help you, you know? So I sometimes get people who would DM me and say, oh, I saw you got, you know, a compostable packaging. Can you tell me where you got it? And then we can share the information. So I think it's so important to find that community and th there are so many great accounts to follow like don't call me oriental like little aircrafts are doing a brilliant series on ec creators on mass race in edinburgh um dear asian roof london they're doing little pockets of community of creatives who we're all doing the same thing we're all trying to run a business to do what we enjoy and we've all sort of you know needed to buy certain things set up websites and stuff like that and I've certainly made mistakes along the way. Like I've done things where I was just like, oh, I wish I knew that I didn't have to do that or oh, I've wasted money on this. And so I would say, you know, I can speak for myself. Like my DMs are open if you want me to look at something. If you're a designer who wants someone to look at your portfolio or you want to know where the best place to set up a website is, like I'm here. So it's, yeah, try and reduce that stress and workload for yourself by reaching out and asking people. And I'm sh more than sure that they'll be happy to help you. Yeah, definitely, 100%. That's, um, that's kind of like our biggest narrative as an agency is find your community, be it um, professionally or um, with the scene and the East Heritage. Always find, there's always someone out there that will help you. And if you have that experience, there'll be somebody else. Um, you know, we always think to find those connections and you'll definitely, you'll, you, you open one door and look at like all the people that we found now, um, the consume community and everything we have so many lovely people that are willing to help um so would we say that that's your tip as a round off do you have any any other tips 
Uh, other tips yeah just I guess follow as many accounts as possible I know that social media gets a bad rap because you know there are some um, bad apples out there but I have found you know it's so enriching and I honestly say this honestly I don't know where I'd be without this community and I know we met online but whatever it has mattered so much to me and even when I went to Conji Club the other night and meeting people who were just like I had no idea this existed and someone said to me I felt really lonely and um, I had no idea there were people around like you guys doing this and you know they were from Malaysia and they were just like I haven't eaten congee since I came over from Malaysia and it was just you know mind-blowing you know that people can come and you know easily feel a sense of home away from home and so yeah just I guess follow and you know I can speak for BC and we're we're so there for you like everyone you, you don't have to ever feel like there isn't someone to speak to or if we can't we can certainly help you because that's a part of our name we're a network and so if we can't help you there will be someone who we can connect you with and we're in the process of learning too we're not perfect uh, there's six of us we're all volunteers and we're trying our best but um, I've come a long way. I've definitely learned so much from people around me. So yeah, connect, I think. My advice is just to connect. Yeah, I think on that point as well, I think it's like good to find out that everybody's on a learning curve. Like we'll all get it wrong, but as long as you have that community, someone will, you know, there's someone to ask and there's someone to help you over it. Um, yeah, it's a big learning curve for everybody, I think. I don't think it, it can be like, in all aspects of life, it's a big learning curve. Um, yeah. And if anyone's wondering about Conji Club, it's over on the Little Yellow Rice Co. account. Um, I still feel a little bit overwhelmed by the Conji Club and people coming. Um, but yeah, you can find that on Little Yellow Rice Co.'s account for uh, Manchester. Um, Easy of things to do. But thank you so much, Amy. It's always a pleasure to chat to you. We will be, uh, we'll put this on our YouTube channel so people can watch back. Um, and I think we will hopefully have a chat to you in the future about doing one of our consumer community events once we get our creative conversations running up again um, and get you on a panel to speak to the wider audience. I'm sure there's uh, some people that would love to hear about it that's kind of career changes because we just don't hear enough about career changes um, and the support that we need and a little bit of confidence to try and do something different. So thank you so much for this wishful stop tour of your career and uh, be seen. Um, we'll post this up later and thank you so much to everyone that's watched and I'll speak to you very soon. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Bye. Bye.